Welcome everyone to the webinar, Partners of First Resort, America, Europe, and the Future of the West. My name is Michael Doyle. On behalf of my colleague and co-director, Professor Lori Damrosh of the Center on Global Governance of Columbia Law School, and with the kind co-sponsorship of the Saltzman Institute, I welcome you to this webinar. This afternoon, we will explore the future of NATO and transatlantic relations. 70 years ago, America and Europe came together in an alliance designed to provide collective defense. The peer strategic threat was the USSR. The threat was kinetic, a potential armed invasion of Western Europe. And the European allies, once their industrial might was revived, would be net security producers joined with a preeminently powerful and wealthy US. But the alliance and the transatlantic relationships today is in a crisis. President Trump repeatedly refused to endorse the key Article 5 collective defense commitment. Uh, President Macron famously described the alliance as brain dead. And today, some see China rather than Russia as the key threat to the Atlantic democracies. Moreover, threats are as much cyber, as kinetic, as much economic, as military, and many of the newest members of the expanded NATO are likely to remain permanent security consumers, burdens, not producers of security. Given these and other challenges, we could not be more fortunate in having three distinguished panelists to help sort out the parameters of a renewed transatlantic partnership. All three are veterans of the Obama-Biden administration, they are, however, not speaking for the Biden transition. But to this observer, Partners of First Resort, the book we are launching, reads like the build back better of NATO and, and the transatlantic partnership. Let me introduce and welcome the two co-authors, Ambassador David McCain and Professor Bart Shevchik and their distinguished co-panelist, General David Petraeus. General Petraeus is a partner in the global investment firm KKR and chairman of the KKR Global Institute, which he established in May 2013. Prior to joining KKR, General Petraeus served for 37 years in the US military, culminating his career with six consecutive commands, five of which were in combat. They included command of the 101st Airborne Division during the fight to Baghdad in the first year in Iraq, command of the Multinational Security Transition Command in Iraq, command of coalition forces in Iraq during the surge, command of the US Central Command, and command of coalition forces in Afghanistan. Following retirement for the military and after Senate confirmation by a vote of 94 to zero, Imagine that in the current polarized America. He served as director of the CIA. I first met David 38 some years ago when he was an MPA student. David, it's a great pleasure to see you again after so many years. Pleasure is mine, Michael. Ambassador David McCain served as director of policy planning at the US Department of State and as US ambassador to Luxembourg. He is currently a senior fellow uh, at the German Marshall Fund. He is the author of four acclaimed political histories and biographies and a forthcoming book, Watching Darkness Fall, Franklin Roosevelt and His Ambassadors in Europe. Professor Bart Shevchik is known to many of us at CLS from the time when he visited us as a scholar in residence and lecturer in law. Bart served as a member of the policy planning staff at the US Department of State and senior policy advisor to the US ambassador to the UN, as well as advisor on global affairs at the European Commission's think tank. He is now adjunct professor of, at Sciences Po in Paris and an author of two forthcoming books, Europe's Grand Strategy and European Sovereignty, Legitimacy and Power. Our three guests will be engaging in a conversation for about 30 minutes and then we will open the Zoom to questions from you, the audience, 
and we will wrap up at about 1.20. Gentlemen, uh, the screen is yours. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Michael, for the kind introductions. Uh, it's great to be reunited with you today after several, several decades after our time together at Princeton. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here today as well, and I thank Columbia Law School for hosting us virtually. Uh, the audience should know again that Professor Doyle was one of my intellectual heroes when he was teaching and I was studying at that other Ivy League university across the New York, New Jersey state line, uh, as was his wife, Amy Gutman, of course, now the president at Penn. Uh, I followed him ever since, including when he worked for the UN Secretary General and my admiration for him continues. Columbia is very lucky to have Michael Doyle, even if he studied at a military academy other than West Point before transferring to one of those other Ivy League universities up north in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he earned his BA, MA, and PhD degrees. Uh, I am sure there must be a sweatshirt at the Columbia bookstore that says, thank God for Harvard, everyone can't get into Columbia. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, work with me. Uh, well, it's a true pleasure to be on this virtual stage with two of my former State Department colleagues from the Obama days, David McKean and uh, Bart Shefchek. Uh, they've written a terrific book, uh, again, titled Partners of First Resort, America, Europe, and the Future of the West. Uh, again, David served as the Director of Policy Planning for Secretary of State John Kerry, continuing the long tradition of grand strategists at state policy planning like George Kennan and Paul Nitza. Uh, Bart served on the policy planning staff and also concurrently as a senior policy advisor to the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Samantha Power, shuttling between New York and D.C. every few days. More recently, they both served as policy volunteers on the Biden campaign, and we all have our ears to the ground to see if there might be new employment opportunities for them. Uh, in their book, David and Bart lay out a vision to reinvent and reinvigorate the transatlantic relationship. Having served with NATO forces and assignments from second lieutenant to one, three, and four-star general, I am a considerable believer in the enormous value of the transatlantic relationship. Noting, of course, that it is much broader than just that of the world's most successful security alliance. In any event, the book could not be more timely. And it has already gotten great reviews from a wide range of statesmen and scholars on both sides of the Atlantic. For example, Jose Manuel Barroso, the former president of the European Commission, former prime minister of Portugal, and now chairman of Goldman Sachs International writes, at a time when the transatlantic relationship faces the most difficult moment since its creation, partners of first resort is an affirmation of the vital bonds that tie Europe and the United States, a common history and a shared destiny. From firsthand experience as president of the European Commission for 10 years, and as the world becomes more uncertain and volatile, only a strong and enduring partnership of first resort between the European Union and the US can meet the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. McCain and Shevchek's book is a contribution to rekindle the transatlantic instinct that delivered 70 years of peace and prosperity on both sides of the Atlantic and beyond. Likewise, Herman von Rompuy, the former president of the European Council notes, this book of David McCain and Bart Shevchek comes on time. It is time for a reset, working together instead of working against each other. Again, multilateralism instead of unilateralism. A pivot to the European Union on the American side and for us, a pivot to the US. This book radiates that will. Beyond that, the book's core arguments about reinvigorating and reinventing the transatlantic partnership have all also already been affirmed by President-elect Biden, a longtime Atlanticist and his European counterparts in phone calls a few weeks ago. And of course, it's very fitting that we discuss this book here at Columbia, the alma mater, not only for the last president we all served, President Barack Obama, but also for the president with whom the book's story begins, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and also of whom, of course, the university of which Dwight Eisenhower was president before he became president of the United States. So before we turn to the present and the future of the West, uh, David, Ambassador, let me turn to you to give us a sense of how the modern West 
built was built within the Atlantic Charter. Thank you, General. Um, first of all, I just want to thank Michael for hosting us today. We uh, we very much appreciate the opportunity. And General, it's uh, it's really an honor to be sharing a screen with you today. Um, you have an extraordinary career, and uh, you've been somebody who we've all admired for years. So it's it's a great pleasure to to be with you today. Uh, you know, our fundamental argument is that uh, the transatlantic relationship is key um, to the restoration and the strengthening of the liberal international order, to the rules-based order, whatever you choose to call it. And that that order has been fraying for years. Um, and that particularly, uh, especially in the last four years, um, it has been um, seriously uh, both denigrated and in many ways shattered. Uh, David Ignatius wrote a piece in the Washington Post last month, and he quoted Henry Kissinger on what it would take to reinvigorate and to restore the liberal international order. And, he, and he, he, he said two things. He said, one, common purpose on big issues, even as other rivalries occur, and mutual security for all powers. And I think it's very important to keep those two sort of fundamental principles in mind as we talk about this, because in, they are really the bedrock of the transatlantic alliance. And both Bart and I will, will come back to them in our discussion. Uh, but I do want to just take a minute and tell you how we structured the book. Um, in, the, in the first half of the book, we provide a, a history of the transatlantic alliance. And we do that because we think it's very, very important to understand um, not only where we are presently and where we want to go in the future, but where we've been, because that will help to inform us uh, as we think about um, crafting a strategy for the future. And I don't want to uh, overdraw the comparison, but uh, there are some important similarities between the 1930s and what we see today. Um, there was, of course, in the 1930s, the serious economic depression, but it's, uh, it's had a serious deleterious effect uh, globally. Um, in the United States, um, in the 1930s, prior to Franklin Roosevelt, we had a somewhat ineffectual president um, who blamed foreign powers for the global depression. The mood of the country in, in, during that time, even when after Roosevelt was elected in 1932, was, was very isolationist. And one thing that's sort of interesting, you know, there was a very strong America First movement then. People tend to forget that. Uh, they think that Donald Trump uh, invented America first. Not so. Uh, and lastly, this was really a struggle at the time between authoritarianism, which was, at the time was cloaked in fascism, and democracy. And in many ways, we're seeing that, I think, repeated um, in many parts of the world as well. But one event that we, that we really focus on in our book is a meeting between uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt off the coast of Newfoundland in August 1941. It was a secret meeting. And um, from Churchill's point of view, it was a critical meeting and as well as from Roosevelt's point of view. But at the time, of course, England was being severely bombed by Nazi Germany. They were greatly weakened. Um, they, uh, they were nearly broke and Churchill needed military and economic assistance. Roosevelt wanted to give that assistance and he wanted to negotiate a deal with them, but he also was looking beyond the war, that, um, even then in 1941. He was looking beyond, he wanted to know about the, what Churchill's ideas were for the post-war world, um, what, what it would look like. And um, he had felt that the Treaty of Versailles had failed miserably. Um, he, he understood that there, there needed to be a new world order in order for countries to live in peace and to gain prosperity in the future. And he knew that Britain, though Great Britain, though wounded and that um, though it was again um, in the middle of a very, very difficult time, it still had an empire, <laughs> a large empire. And um, that if he and Churchill could agree on certain principles, it would be very, very important. And so, and at the end of this meeting off the coast of Newfoundland, they actually issued something called the Atlantic Charter, uh, which many of you may be familiar with. And just to 
very briefly recount its sort of main components. One was the disarmament of aggressor nations, uh, obviously uh, Italy and, and, and Germany. Um, also uh, self-determination for people around the world. And this was you know, a very major concession by Winston Churchill, who at heart was a profound imperialist and again, uh, the, the leader of an empire. Uh, but he, he has signed on because again, he was in a very weak position politically vis-a-vis uh, -vis Roosevelt. Um, and so it was, a, it was a major concession. Third was uh, the, the uh, principle of respect for the sovereignty of nations. And interestingly, that's an issue that I have a feeling we'll talk about a little bit today as well. Um, it's a very, very important principle. And fourth, we have to remember that Roosevelt, again, was also managing a domestic crisis, economic crisis at the time. He had given a speech called the Four Freedoms, and those were freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, meaning from hunger and poverty, and freedom from fear. And he wanted to make those universal principles. And again, this was something that both he and, and, uh, and Churchill ultimately agreed on. And the reason we think that meeting was so important, it was a vision statement, um, nothing more than a vision statement. But um, out of that vision, we believe the, the foundation for the new world order was, was born. And I'm referring to the creation of the United Nations in 1945, uh, NATO in 1949, uh, the, the uh, Treaty of Rome in 1957, which ultimately uh, created the, the European Union, gave birth to the European Union. And so Bart and I, in our book, what we do is we call for an updating or a restatement um, of the Atlantic Charter. Um, I wish we could say we're the first to do that, we're not. Uh, President H.W. Bush, before he left office, um, this was something that he discussed, he believed um, strongly in it. And it's also something that Kissinger has uh, mused about from time to time as well. Um, one of the things we learned in policy planning is that you do need a vision and it's very, very important to have one. And then you need to put together a strategy. And when you're putting together that strategy, you've got to understand what the challenges are, what the impediments are. And you also have to ask, what are the alternatives? And that sometimes is, is one of the questions that uh, we think a lot of naysayers um, don't ask sufficiently. And so um, then you can put together a strategy. And I think before, uh, before we sort of talk about what it is we're, we're thinking about in terms of a strategic approach to the transatlantic relationship, I, why don't I turn it back to you, General, and uh, you can then ask perhaps Bart to continue on a little bit more on the book or, or ask questions, whatever, however you'd like to proceed. Well, in fact, I'll fast forward to the end of the Cold War. Uh, and I will ask Bart uh, how the relationship evolved in the 1990s and the 2000s. Over to you, Professor. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much, General. And uh, let me echo David's uh, um, words about uh, how, how much of an honor it is to share uh, the screen with you and be on the panel with you. Um, like I, I, I probably not uh, the only one, but uh, you were certainly an intellectual hero of mine when I was studying at Princeton and uh, ever since then. So uh, thank you again for all of your public service and uh, uh, not only contributions in, in government, but also your intellectual contributions through panels like this uh, and in other capacities. And also thank let you. me thank you, Michael and Columbia for hosting us. Uh, I was actually fortunate enough to join the Obama administration uh, coming from Columbia Law School, and it was probably Columbia's seal of approval that uh, got the final uh, deal done uh, and after several attempts uh, that were less successful. So uh, thanks again to Columbia for hosting us. Luckily, this is not a faculty meeting because uh, we would not be able to speak for so long. It would be uh, immediately interrupted after a few minutes with uh, questions that would essentially uh, destroy our argument. But uh, be that as it may, uh, it's, great to, it's great to be back. Uh, so for, fast forwarding to the end of the Cold War, you know, uh, sometimes people mythologize the simplicity and transatlantic unity during the Cold War, but the real golden age of the West and the liberal order, as it were, occurred in our view in the 1990s. You had NATO and the EU with enlargement uh, and the fascinating notion that all major powers, including Russia and China, would become liberal democracies. 
Uh, this was uh, actually mentioned several times in US national security strategies and was a practical proposal that was entertained by both the George W. Bush administration uh, and, uh, and the Clinton administration. Uh, and you know, essentially you had a basic global model for success uh, based around uh, the notion of liberal democracies, uh, democracy, human rights, rule of law, free trade, and market capitalism. And in some ways, even though in the 2000s, obviously 9-11 and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq dominated US foreign policy concerns, uh, they did not actually fundamentally change the strategic trajectory uh, of the liberal model. Uh, and then we get to the 2008 financial crisis uh, and the Russia-Georgia war, which fundamentally both internally and externally undercut this strategic narrative. And so in essence, in our view, the modern story is, of the West is a, effectively a struggle between the hopes of 1989, uh, a year that celebrated the success and enlargement of the liberal order, uh, and the fears of 2008, a year that was remembered for its internal challenges and external threats from the liberal actors. And we think that the main question for the current moment in time is whether leaders live up to their best aspirations, to the hopes of 89 again, or will succumb to the panic and doubt of 2008 or, or perhaps uh, in recent years. Um, you know, in some ways, while the West had had become a, essentially a victim of its own success, its model of democracy, human rights, rule of law, market economy, and free trade had widespread appeal around the world. But in some ways, you could argue that uh, this concept became uh, a bit overstretched. And in practice, uh, countries like Russia and China uh, did not uh, seem to be following uh, the same trend lines as may have been expected in the 1990s and 2000s. Let me briefly mention a couple of words on the Obama administration before uh, turning it back over to you, General. You know, in some ways, when President Obama came to office, uh, he really sought an equitable partnership with Europe. The phrase that he often used was to be partners with Europe, not patrons of. Uh, and it was fascinating that he, the most number of meetings uh, that he had with uh, leaders around the world were actually with European counterparts through various transatlantic summits and meetings in the first three years. Notwithstanding all that uh, interaction, the main diplomatic action and concrete achievements appeared to occur elsewhere. Uh, you had the reset with Russia, pivot to Asia, and an overall new engagement with the world through formats such as the G20 and other uh, venues. The G20, of course, was central to the global economic recovery in 2009. Uh, and in some ways, the may, most tangible form of transatlantic cooperation, uh, NATO's intervention in Libya in 2011, proved to be a short-term success, but long-term cautionary lesson. And of course, in the second term uh, of the Obama administration, you had Russia's aggression in Ukraine, terrorist attacks throughout Europe, and mass irregular migration, which centralized or prioritized, again, European policy within the Obama administration. Uh, but in some ways, uh, this was on the heels of lots of other crises around the world. And it was difficult to exactly say um, you know, how, where the political attention would lie. And so in some ways, notwithstanding President Obama's popularity among Europeans and its um, you know, uh, his personal popularity was uh, at very high levels in the 2008 campaign and, and has stayed this way since then. Essentially, transatlantic achievements were increasingly difficult to distinguish from global achievements, ranging from nuclear nonproliferation to climate change. Uh, it's interesting that his Nobel Peace Prize was not followed by the Charlemagne Prize, which is uh, in, for work done in service of European integration. Uh, the last American, inter interestingly, to receive that award was Bill uh, Clinton. And the only tr distinctly transatlantic project, uh, TTIP, was not successful. And NATO's enlargement to Montenegro did not really compare in significance to the expansions of the 1990s and 2000s. Uh, and so for all of their personal affinity for President Obama, Europeans are more likely to recall, again, the reset with Russia uh, the red line in Syria or the pivot to Asia is the main policies that affected them rather than any of the global successes. And of course, all of that unfolds uh, in a reality 
where we recognize that contrary to Francis Fukuyama's assertion that uh, we'd seen the end of history uh, when he posited, of course, that history was a competition between different systems of how you elect governance uh, and how you run an economy, the Western democratically elected and free market economies versus the Soviet Union's uh, Communist Party uh, and command economy. Uh, and now history is back with a vengeance. Uh, and there's a new competition uh, between the continued Western systems, but which are suffering from a variety of populist uh, challenges and other issues. Uh, and some would say overstretch or what have you. And then the extraordinarily successful uh, Chinese Communist Party, one party state uh, and state capitalism, uh, which has enabled that country to do what no other country in history has ever done in a 41 year period at this point, uh, which is to sustain incredible economic growth uh, at, at or above double digits for much of that time. And then as you argue in your book and you note, David, the center appears to unravel within the West uh, as well as the wider global order, uh, particularly with the election of Donald Trump. Right, thank you. Um, you know, it, it, I think what Bart, uh, the, the brief history he gave, President Obama had uh, become mired somewhat in the, uh, not somewhat, had become mired in the politics and wars of the Middle East, and he had not been able to, I think, fulfill his vision of rebalancing to Asia. But nevertheless, he did, uh, fortify the, the transatlantic alliance. Um, when in 2016, Donald Trump was a candidate for president, uh, he was not taken particularly seriously in the beginning as everyone knows. He ran against 11 competitors on the Republican side and yet he managed to win the nomination. And then, of course, if, if you remember, he ran against Hillary Clinton, who uh, President Obama had called the most qualified candidate in history, and he won. And um, this was all, I think, shocking to a lot of people. Um, his inaugural address uh, was, in many ways, uh, a signal for how he planned to engage internationally. He, uh, I mean, if you, again, if you remember, at this time, we were eight years beyond uh, the, the economic crisis of, of 2008. Um, the country was actually doing pretty well uh, economically. Uh, unemployment was down. Uh, the market was up. Um, and uh, we, uh, well, again, while we were, I think, uh, in a difficult period internationally. President Obama was widely admired around the world. And yet in his inaugural address, uh, President Trump described the United States as being in uh, a period of carnage. And he uh, again believed that the answer to that was, was that America first uh, needed to become the overriding principle um, for our international relations. And in short, what he was saying that our alliances would be replaced by a zero sum game, that um, it was fine to have uh, alliances as long as they uh, supported whatever we did. And that's not often the way the world works. You know, still it was something of a surprise, at least to me, how um, hostile he was to the, uh, to our European allies. And um, I, I'm not gonna go through sort of the litany of, of, of insults that he heaped on Europe, but I mean, he called Brussels, early on he called Brussels a hellhole. Um, he threatened to withdraw from NATO several times. Um, he appointed, you know, as we all know, a hotel executive with no prior diplomatic experience as our ambassador to the EU. And that ambassador said that his, felt that one of his, uh, felt that his principal mission was to destroy the EU. So Bart and I, we interviewed a number of people about the, the Trump years. And um, I think the, the sort of kindest thing that we heard was that um, President Trump really didn't have a foreign policy. Um, 
I'm not sure that's entirely accurate, but um, in any event, I, I think that it was clearly perceived as a transformation of American foreign policy and, and, um, and not positively in, in, in that regard. Um, you know, the question is, what can a Biden administration do to repair the, the damage? And Bart and I, um, before again, we sort of lay out our strategy, we talk about what some of the impediments are and what, what are the challenges. And clearly there are both internal and external challenges and they are significant. Um, the internal challenges are that we are a very divided nation. Um, and uh, you know, this is something that Richard Haas has written about a lot, that uh, the eyes of the world are on us and what do they see? They see a country where um, you know, our politics uh, often appear broken, um, where the majority of people don't really understand the value of alliances. They don't understand the value of foreign assistance. Um, most people think we spend way too much money on foreign assistance. Um, we've been, even though we are doing relative to the rest of the world, we're doing well um, economically, we've been seriously weakened by COVID. And you know, we have the highest infection rate, the highest death rate. Um, and we've got a lot of cultural issues that will continue to um, continue to be of, I think, uh, great debate and consternation uh, over the next four years, whether it's uh, the issue of systemic racism, gun violence, um, there are a number of issues. There are also are external challenges that we face um, in our relations with Europe. Um, first of all, we, uh, and, and internationally uh, more broadly, first of all, it's the issue of, uh, of Russia, which I think Bart and I feel is a declining um, power, yet you have, you have uh, a power that is still formidable, able to project beyond its own borders, um, often a malign influence. Um, China is a very different story, and uh, General Petraeus uh, discussed that br briefly, and I think it was absolutely correct. Uh, China is an extraordinary country. Um, it is a, um, a nation that is very much on the rise. They, uh, Xi Jinping has a strategy, has a vision, and he has very definitely has a strategy uh, for attaining that, that, that vision. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but it is, uh, you know, he is an authoritarian, he's president for life. And um, he is, a, China is very much a competitor. They can be a collaborator on certain issues, but they're very much a competitor and they may be an adversary in, in some respects as well. So um, with all of this, this sort of background, um, perhaps a um, general, we, Bart may want to just lay out a little bit of what it is we've proposed. Sure. Um, you know, I should point out that, of course, President Trump was certainly by no means the first president to criticize uh, European countries for their failure to live up to their Wales summit uh, commitments to spend 2% of GDP on defense. I heard Secretary Gates, for example, at a NATO meeting in what was his final session where I thought it would be a warm and gracious, uh, and he just railed about that. I heard President Obama at another NATO uh, summit actually uh, do the same thing, and President Bush was not reticent on that issue either. But clearly, uh, the current administration took this to new levels, and, and as you said, uh, it really became an issue to a degree of true hostility uh, to the alliance, a very, very different approach. Um, but here we are now, uh, there's a bit of sort of hopeful feeling, uh, not unlike that, uh, that we were discussing before this started back in 2009. Uh, I remember going to the Munich, uh, security conference that year, and there was just, just this wave of optimism and so forth. And Richard Holbrook striding around the room. And I recall vice president Biden, and I forget whether it was he or secretary Clinton who pressed the reset button for the relationship with Russia, all of this. There's a little bit of, uh, of deja vu uh, at this time with the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris being welcomed, uh, perhaps almost with relief across Europe. But the question is, where do we go from here? Um, you know, there's a, obviously an ongoing coronavirus pandemic that 
claimed more lives yesterday than were lost in the 9-11 attacks. Uh, there's a global recession uh, in the US. Uh, in aggregate, it looks pretty good, but there's really a K-shaped recovery uh, ongoing beneath the surface. There are pressing climate issues. There's a continued threat of Islamist extremism. The extraordinary rise of China um, in a sense that perhaps economics no longer trumps geopolitics uh, when it comes to that relationship that now geopolitics are at the fore. Uh, the resurgence of Russia, even if a declining power can certainly create a lot of mischief as we've seen in Georgia, Ukraine, Crimea, the Baltic states, et cetera. And the emergence of populism in many democracies at this critical point in time, as well as a number of other crises. So Bart, um, where do we go from here? Thanks so much, General. So, you know, the cover of our book has a big picture of a blue sky in the middle and it's supposed to evoke the spirit of what's sometimes known as the blue sky memo uh, in US government circles. And the U blue sky memo is supposed to be ambitious, visionary, but still within the realm of the feasible, something that uh, can be practical enough so that if there is enough political will behind the idea, it could be implemented. And so take our recommendations in that, in that spirit, in that vein of thought. Uh, and we do have a unique opportunity, uh, as you mentioned, General. Uh, we have potentially the most transatlanticist US administration in decades, uh, including an alum of Columbia Law School with uh, Tony Blinken as the nominee for Secretary of State. Uh, and I think both sides recognize uh, that this is a unique moment to make headway. And the real question is what to do. So what we propose is uh, two things. One is, as David alluded uh, at the beginning, uh, a restatement and updating of the Atlantic Charter principles. We suggest a new transatlantic strategic partnership agreement, which would lay out essentially key areas of foreign policy and economic coordination and establish a transatlantic council to facilitate cooperation at head of state, ministerial, and staff levels. And for instance, we think that if these structures were in place, an issue like COVID, uh, which you know, uh, was identified, at least within the US uh, government in late December of last year, early this year, but probably was not on the top of uh, leaders' radar screens in Europe until uh, the outbreak actually happened, uh, an issue like this, if proper structures were in place, hopefully would be uh, drawn up the chain of command on both sides of the Atlantic. And uh, the virtue of these types of institutions is that they save you time. And as we've uh, recognized in the uh, COVID pandemic, a lot of times uh, the cost of time is and, and uh, delays can be uh, enormous. And so just imagine if the world, if the transatlantic partnership was able to act two or three months or four months earlier, how much that would have saved. But of course, you know, we're, we're not trying to just uh, fix or address past problems, but also look towards the future. And we think that we need essentially a big tent approach with a, a big agenda and a large membership to be able to uh, meet the challenges of our time be it the rise of China, the resurgence of Russia, uh, future pandemics, or uh, global economic recovery. Now, none of this type of cooperation is on autopilot, and a lot of work will need to be, uh, will be necessary to build back better after the past four years. Uh, and perhaps, you know, even more important than negotiating a new text or establishing novel structures will be the psychological impact of restoring the old ethos that characterize the West. Um, and you know, luckily with the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, we think that we have a great opportunity. Uh, in fact, uh, our, the title of our book comes from a quote of President-elect Joe Biden from seven years ago at the Munich Security Conference where he described uh, Europe as the cornerstone of our engagement with the world and uh, referred to Europe as America's indispensable partner of first resort. Uh, something that President Obama described as an enduring truth of American foreign policy. And incidentally, just a few weeks ago, the EU's HRVP, Joseph Borrell, in his address to the European Parliament also stated, uh, the EU and the United States uh, are and will remain strategic partners of first resort. And uh, he noted that essentially the success, success 
in foreign policy for the EU uh, leads through synergies with the US and vice versa. Now, uh, you might think this is all <laughs> Uh, rosy uh, colored uh, glasses uh, view on the on the situation and I think we're conscious of the fact that there will be competing uh, uh, competing considerations on the US side and also different visions for the transatlantic partnership uh, in Europe you know in fact it's been fascinating to see the debate in recent weeks between French President Emmanuel Macron and the German defense minister in terms of how much emphasis to place on the transatlantic partnership uh, versus perhaps a European first or Europeanist approach. And let me just close with one uh, caveat, which is uh, we're very careful about our language and partners of first resort does not mean only resort. And obviously other partners, especially in Asia, such as Australia, India, Japan, and South Korea will be integral for global collective action. But what we have in mind is basically repairing and reimagining the transatlantic core engine for wider collective action. And it was fascinating to see at the Munich Security Conference just this past year, uh, the Indian foreign minister say, make the argument that essentially, if the West doesn't get its act together, you could forget about multilateralism and global collective action because it just doesn't work. You need the West to uh, be at, in, in the leadership position. And so in some ways, uh, I'm based currently in Brussels, and in some ways what we envision in, in the transatlantic partnership for the wider liberal order is akin to Franco-German leadership within the EU. And when France and Germany get together and figure out um, you know, where a center of gravity in public opinion might lie, the EU machinery is quite effective. And interestingly, just last year, notwithstanding 60 years of uh, very close European integration, France and Germany reached a new treaty for, to forge closer cooperation at the Treaty of Aachen and uh, greater coordination between the two countries. And so essentially that's what we have in mind, core engine that branches outwards as well. But let me turn it back to you, General, and to uh, Professor Doyle. Well, let me um, just say a few words first. And I guess, Michael, we should be asking uh, for the attendees, the students to be sending in questions, uh, presumably by the question or chat feature here. Uh, and I'll stall while they were, are doing that. Um, or they could please use the blue hand function, which uh, is there you go. Okay. see they raise their hand. You know, I was at that Munich Security Conference, and I heard, and I know Foreign Minister Jai Shanker very, very well from when he was the ambassador here. He was, of course, also the ambassador in Beijing, and he was the foreign secretary, the number two, uh, uh, subsequent to being uh, here in Washington. And he said that, ironically, uh, just weeks before the pandemic shutdown and months before the crisis that has taken place between China and India, you know, on the so-called roof of the world and the line of actual control up in the, the Himalayas, essentially, or the extension of that, uh, and the subsequent back and forth between China and India that has resulted in the shutdown of, I think, over now 100 ap applications of uh, Chinese software applications and so forth, including TikTok and WeChat, I believe. Um, and of course, all this before other developments in the relationships between China and the United States, which have been a tit for tat, uh, slight escalation uh, almost every week or month, uh, China and Australia, even China and the EU in a variety of different ways. And you know, this comes back to the common cause that we spoke of earlier, uh, Henry Kissinger and mutual security. And it seems to me that one of the common causes, if not the principal common cause would be around what is clearly the most important relationship in the world, more important than all of the others together, I would submit, and that's the US-China relationship one which presumably will be pursued by the incoming administration in a way that is characterized by coherence, comprehensiveness, all of the tools, all harnessed together, whole of governments with an S on the end, and again, bringing back in all partners and allies, uh, including, uh, uh, of course, our foremost partners uh, in the EU and NATO. And I, it almost, brings to mind whether or not, and I'm curious for both of your thoughts on this, 
whether there should be this conference of democracies that some have proposed. It would be a G7 plus 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 maybe, I'm not sure how large it would be, but it would not be the entire G20 needless to say, because it would be the democratic countries of the world, presumably free market countries of the world. Um, do you see merit in that? And, and are your interlocutors in the now uh, president-elect's uh, circle talking about that? Why don't we get a quick answer to that question, and then we'll go to the queue of our attendees. I think it's a fascinating question. Why don't we start off with that, either David or Bart? Uh, just very quickly, I mean, I do see merit in that. I think there are a number of issues that, um, and we actually uh, have a, at the end of our book, five issues that we believe are ones that we need to engage with, not only with the European Union, but clearly with the, the with the uh, with the rest of the democratic uh, world, and those are on climate, clearly on public health, on technology, on trade, and on cyber. And so there's a lot of room for agreement. And again, um, you know, we're not going to uh, agree with all of our democratic allies on every issue. But for example, on the issue of, of public health, on COVID, and on the issue of climate, I think there's a, a way to really jump jumpstart uh, solutions to both of those on a global basis. And presumably on issues that likely will feature as well uh, with more prominence, human rights and democracy, although those are very, very difficult and tricky issues given that some of our most important partners in the greater Middle East uh, in particular are not all featuring those particular uh, elements. But Bart, anything you want to add to that? And then I'll hand it back to, to Michael. Yeah, I, I agree with David. I would just add that, you know, there is already an institution called the Community of Democracies uh, that was launched uh, in the 2000s. And it's a relatively large group and in some ways because of its size it really hasn't taken off as a forum for uh, effective decision making and or even consultation and in some ways it's actually stagnated you know the sum of democracies could go in one of two ways i, I guess one would be you know uh leading democracies that are uh committed to joint global action including on covid or climate and china and then you probably are looking for uh, a sizable group, but one that is still manageable enough so that you can uh, reach agreement uh, and, uh, and, and actually you know, follow up on, on that agreement. Uh, the other model would be uh, a, a venue where uh, it's primarily sort of more inward looking in a way to reaffirm the democratic principles and human rights values and rule of law that have undergirded our societies and our political systems and make sure that we actually live up to those aspirations that, uh, you know, uh, and there's been some backsliding <laughs> to be frank on both sides of the Atlantic uh, and elsewhere in the world. And so this would be a, a different type of model. I don't know whether the Biden-Harris team has uh, decided which way they want to lean or, you know, uh, where, President-elect Biden's um, mind is on this particular issue, and uh, time will tell exactly which way which way they go. Thank you both for those comments. Uh, I would jump in with my own two cents on this issue before moving on, agreeing with both of those uh, responses. There's you know, there are ideas floating around about a G10, which looks a lot like this. The only caution that I would put on that uh, endorsement, because I think the idea of a democratic caucus is a very good idea. You know, so many of the key problems that the three of you have just outlined have to do with our relations with China and with Russia, with Russia when it comes to arms control, with China when it comes to climate. I get reminded of a, a phrase often attributed to the salty language of uh, Lyndon Bain Johnson when he was talking about it, with whom you should cooperate. And he posed the question is, you know, do you want, the, do you want him inside the tent 
urinating, he used a different word, out, <laughs> or outside the tent, urinating in. And so we're going to have to have tight and cooperative relations to the extent possible as well with uh, China and Russia. And so we can't, as, as, the t as you t both of you just suggested, al allow the Democratic caucus to dominate everything. Uh, so, uh, but it has to be part of who we are and where our first resort partners are likely to lie. Let me stop here. I've got some really good questions. Uh, I'd like to first go to uh, Christina Bembenek, who had a very interesting, challenging question for the three of you. And uh, I'll turn the floor over to her. I think you can speak. Is that correct, Christina? Uh, yeah. Yes, sir, if you can hear me. The floor is yours. Oh, fantastic. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Christina Bambenek. I'm the Army War College Fellow here at SEPA. And I have a question about uh, Trump's current foreign policy, which the, really the only constant seems to be that it's transactional in nature. But my question is, might there be some merit to this transactional foreign policy, particularly if we're looking at uh, formal recognition of some longstanding de facto situations, like uh, recognizing the Western Sahara as part of Morocco, the Golan Heights as part of Israel, UAE recognizing Israel formally. Uh, the US does seem to receive some tangible benefits from just stating the situation as it is or has been on the ground. So I was just wondering, do you, do you see any merits in that policy? Thank you. Can I do, do it as a blunt soldier? Um, if you're gonna run a transactional uh, arrangement, you ought to get something for what you do. And the question I think that some of these actions have, have begged uh, is what did we get? Because we have, of course, recognized uh, the Golan as part of Israel. Uh, there were United Nations reasons and other norm, norms-based uh, reasons for not doing that, of course, uh, but that is now a fact. But the question I think that people at the time rightly asked, okay, what, what's in it for us? Again, if this is transactional, what would we get out of some of these others? And frankly, there's usually a reason why we have not taken that particular step. Uh, and uh, is the downside of that uh, worth whatever it is that you're going to get in, in turn for having recognized reality? And great to know that you're at, uh, at SEPA. Christina. Thank, thank you for that question. David or Bart, anything you'd like to add in? Yeah, I would just, you know, add that, look, I think President Trump has, um, in, in a few cases, has identified serious, uh, serious issues and, and rightly uh, shined a spotlight on them. Uh, you know, I don't have a problem with the fact that he negotiated with Kim Jong-un in, in uh, North Korea. Um, but as General Petraeus just said, I'm not exactly sure what we got out of it. And um, the problem is, is that he's never called on the, you know, one of the things that I think is important in foreign policy is that you want to always try to use leverage when you can muster it. And the best way, in my view, to muster leverage is not to try to bully other countries. It is through alliances. And so, for example, he never really called on the rest of the world to join the United States after his failed lunch with, uh, failed three lunches with, with uh, Kim Jong-un. And so again, not quite sure what we've got out of it. it. Just very quickly, I also think he has rightly called out China on a number of issues, but I don't see a, a, a strategy behind that. And that's, uh, you know, I think he leaves a very sort of amorphous policy for the Biden administration to sort through. I would just briefly add that going forward, um, the Biden-Harris team, I think, will be very sensitive to ensuring that at the same time that principles of multilateralism and consultation are restored, that uh, foreign policy is also evaluated from the perspective of what does it deliver for the middle class and for uh, average US citizens? Uh, because I think sometimes uh, those two debates, you know, foreign policy debates and then domestic effects uh, are, occur at different tables by different individuals. And so I think there'll be a very conscious effort to try to make sure that those discussions are merged. And so when you're talking about, you know, trade policy or uh, global economic recovery, that we do avoid what General Petraeus mentioned, 
we have now, which is a K-shaped recovery. And in fact, uh, we uh, ensure that the middle class and, uh, and lower uh, economic classes are able to be as successful as uh, the rest of society. And so um, you'll see, I think, a, a conjunction of these two previously separated debates. Again, thank you for that question. I'd like to now turn to uh, uh, Theo uh, Milanopoulos. Theo, the, the floor is yours. Can you speak? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Theo Milanopoulos. I'm a PhD student uh, at Columbia, uh, studying under Professor Doyle and, and Dick Betts. Um, uh, President-elect Biden is likely to inherit a substantial military drawdown um, in the NATO mission in Afghanistan. Um, what are the prospects for the Biden administration to re reverse or reinforce this drawdown? And how are NATO partners likely, likely to respond to these moves? This was for you, General, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess as a former commander and the commander of the commander and then CIA, I might ought to. Um, so look, first of all, I think that the if we do draw down to 2,500, that that is too low. Um, I know that the commander there who, you know, I've served for years in combat with uh, an extraordinary uh, in individual, Scott Miller, has done a very thorough troop to task analysis and could actually get down to 4,500 with a lot of stuff that comes in from outside and flies overhead and use of a lot of contractors inside the wire. Um, and that's an extraordinary uh, achievement actually, Can, keeping in mind that when I was privileged to be the commander of the International Security Assistance Force, we had 100,000 Americans in uniform and we had 50,000 NATO. Uh, and the Afghans are fighting and dying for their country. We do have enduring interests there. We went there to eliminate the Al Qaeda sanctuary in which the 9 11 attacks were planned, the sanctuary that was allowed by the Taliban, who are the ones trying to get rid of us and trying to regain power in the country. So uh, the challenge, I think, and I might defer to the other two just on this issue, because I'm not as attuned to the domestic piece of this, but it would seem to me that it would be a challenge for how to square a circle if you have, are on record as saying that you wanna end endless wars, even if you do add responsibly at the end of it, which is a responsible ed addition, um, because we should recognize that we actually don't end endless wars when we remove our forces. We actually end our involvement in the endless war and the endless war continues and the outcome may very well be worse uh, for having withdrawn our forces, which clearly would be the case uh, in this situation. 2,500 may be so low uh, that you are actually really worried about force protection now um, if you're trying to maintain a certain degree of footprint. By the way, there's also a report out today that we will also, or there's going to be a withdrawal of military support for various of the CIA activities uh, in the covert action realm. I've only seen that in, in the press. These are concerning. Now, the way to square the circle, I guess, would be that Vice President Biden always wanted what he termed a counterterrorism uh, approach to Afghanistan in particular. Frankly, it was not possible in my view uh, back at the time that the surge was done there to, to halt the momentum of the Taliban, roll it back and start the transition to Afghan forces. But at this point in time, it clearly is. Uh, and that might be the way, but it'd be a challenge if he inherits a 2,500 force and has to push it back up to 4,500 uh, that presumably the base uh, of the party might take a dim view of that, but I'll defer to the others who might have their finger on domestic politics pulse uh, better than I. David, or well, Mark, look, a quick response? Yeah, I mean, just just quickly, I, I I think you've, you have put your finger on it. I mean, I think that, and I don't, I don't think this is lost by the way on President Trump, that he's- uh, Of course. To some extent putting uh, President-elect Biden in a box on this. Um, and, you know, I think it's, I have a lot of faith in President Biden that he's gonna in the end do what he thinks is right. Just as he's following the science on the COVID crisis, I believe that on um, an issue like this, that he's gonna listen to his military advisors. And General, you know that you know much better than I do. I don't know what the correct number is. But I, but I honestly believe that if, uh, even if he has to pay somewhat of a political price on it by increasing the, the number of troops somewhat, I believe he'll do that because I think he'll do the right thing. 
I would just add, uh, and I agree with that uh, completely, I would just add that, you know, in Europe, uh, the concern about terrorism is actually a lot higher than it may have been, let's say, 11 years ago, uh, particularly given the uh, number of attacks in 2015 and 16, but also, you know, more recently, in some ways, it's an issue that's much more salient in Europe than perhaps in the United States. And so here's where transatlantic cooperation, again, is I think uh, very important to this type of issue because it's, uh, I, and I obviously can't speak for any European countries, but uh, it is quite possible that uh, they might want to uh, assist with some uh, troop presence in a way that you know, um, may have not been the case, let's say 11 years ago or, or earlier. Actually, they have a troop presence. It's a fairly decent one. And the major contributors have said that if the U.S. draws down, they have to draw down as well. Uh, the, the context being that the U.S. typically is the one that almost establishes an umbrella under which all then uh, huddle to a degree, if you will, for security force protection purposes. And without that sizable U.S. presence, then their presence would be jeopardized. Thank you. Um, we're running out of time. If, if everyone can tolerate us going for a few more minutes, I'd have one more questioner, if that's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm inviting Andrew Schifrin to speak. Please introduce yourself and, and uh, pose your question. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm a 2L at Columbia Law School with just a general interest in foreign policy. Um, it seems like there's an appetite in the U.S. to get tough on China, uh, and that that's maybe a promising arena to partner with Europe. What do you think are the impediments to the U.S. partnering with Europe in countering China? Who wants well, to jump on that one? I, I can just briefly uh, mention a couple of things. You know, I think there, this is actually uh, an area where there's a lot of opportunity for cooperation between Europe and the United States. And in fact, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, sort of at the 11th hour, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and the HRVP Joseph Borrell launched a US-EU dialogue on China. It's a little bit difficult to do at the tail end of an administration uh, as you're heading out of office, but you know, there is uh, the sort of the public and the uh, official opinion in Europe on China has shifted dramatically over the past couple of years, including you know, uh, a, an EU stra strategy document from last year referring to China as a systemic rival amongst a number of other categories in which it uh, put China. And so, look, I think here uh, you're likely to get a high level agreement on the multifaceted nature of the challenge of China. And the devil will really be in the details and making sure that to follow through on some of that high level agreement, which is oftentimes a lot more difficult. And in that uh, vein, I think, again, uh, some of our proposals and institutional proposals uh, could be quite helpful because right now, for instance, you know, if you think about meetings that the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for uh, East Asian Affairs might have, uh, the meetings with European counterparts probably are not at the top of the agenda. Uh, her uh, agenda is probably going to be, you know, trips uh, to various uh, partners in, in Asia. But we think that coordinating with, with Europe uh, on an issue such as China will be very, very important to ultimate success. Great, thank you very much. We've kept everyone through our, a little bit beyond our 120 time. So with apologies for those who have still questions that they would have liked to ask, I wanna take this opportunity to congratulate uh, David and Bart on a fascinating book, Partners of First Resort available on Amazon for downloading right now, and I recommend everyone read it. And I want to especially thank uh, General David Petraeus for joining us uh, this afternoon. It's great to hear your voices of wisdom. Uh, you have improved over the years. You were good back then too, but the improvement is very striking. And so it's a real pleasure, an honor for me to welcome the three of you here to Columbia. And thank you for the enlightenment that you've just offered us on America's still uh, most important uh, set of partners in the world. So thank you very much. Thank you to our attendees. Thanks, I wish thank everyone a, uh, a good day and a uh, healthy time. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks again. Bye bye. bye.